All right, in 1819, the great artist and poet uh, William Blake was having a series of um, seances with his friend John Varley. Uh, Varley was uh, an artist and also an astrologer, and they would meet very late at night. Um, presumably they were drinking, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> and they would have these uh, seances in which Va Varley would sort of challenge Blake to go into a, a kind of a trance state, um, which Blake said he had been able to do really since he was a kid. And in these sort of trance states, he would have visions. And so in 1819, um, he had a vision of a ghost of a flea. And this had a huge impact on the both of them. And um, Blake actually did a painting of the flea, a small miniature. It's actually a beautiful painting. Uh, or strange and beautiful painting. And I'm going to do a version, sort of my own sort of version of it here in today's episode. But it got me thinking about ghosts in general. And so today's episode, we're going to look at ghosts. It, when Blake had this vision, he sort of was sketching it as the ghost of the flea was speaking to him. And the ghost of the flea related um, deep insights into the creation of fleas generally, um, including the fact that... Um, According to the flea, uh, his original uh, structure was so huge, like the size of a bull, that um, uh, that God refused to package such fierceness in such a large uh, organic form. So he shrunk him down to the size of fleas as we know it. And this was just one of the gems of wisdom that uh, Blake learned in this communication from the from the other from the other side so today i want to talk about what are ghosts um how do they relate to memory and also how do they relate um, to metaphysics what are the, what's their metaphysical status so welcome and i hope you enjoy today's episode of monsterology on ghosts okay so here's one of the images we're, we're going to draw a uh, classic drawing of jacob marley and then um, I do an image of William Blake's Ghost of a Flea, and that's what you're seeing here. So I'm going to show you how to do these drawings. You can learn these techniques while I talk about the history and the philosophy of ghosts. And um, <clears throat> in this one, I'm just starting out doing some traditional techniques. You're going to see me do sort of a traditional drawing, but then it starts to get complicated with... Um, colored pencils and then I roll some acrylic paint over it with a brayer roller and that obscures the drawing and then I have to dig it back out again using um, colored pencils and so I think this is a technique that uh, if you watch the channel I use every now and then very effective for creating texture and atmosphere like in the case of a ghost a shrouded figure emerging out of the 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 ether <clears throat> I think this technique works really great for that. Um, the word ghost uh, really comes from a Dutch word geest or the German word geist and um, it's oftentimes associated I think in the certainly in the sort of modern period with the spirit uh, that can be separated from the body but that wasn't always how we thought about um, the soul. Um, there is sort of an interesting story to be told here and a lot of people think, well, you know, human beings, they, they sort of carve up into two basic metaphysical things. One is the body, which is, you know, public, takes up space. Um, and the other is um, the spirit or the soul. And this is immaterial and does not take up space. And this distinction gets articulated most clearly, I think, by the philosopher René Descartes in the 17th century. Uh, it seems to be drawing on a much older tradition within Christianity and possibly back into the ancient world uh, that would sort of include the influences of Plato and, and eventually the Neoplatonists, which had a huge influence on Christianity. For the Greeks, the idea was that, uh, particularly for Plato, who was influenced by Pythagoras, was that there's a kind of part of, the, of us that's pretty obvious, which is just the material body. But uh, according to Plato, the psyche, the suke, or the soul, is sort of trapped in the body. And then when the body dies, the soul goes on in a kind of reincarnation. So this tradition is very old. Um, there's an even older version of it in Hinduism, in the Vedic tradition. 
and the Upanishad tradition, um, there the idea of the soul, which is called Atman in Sanskrit, is this immaterial sort of spark of the divine within each one of us. And when the body dies, the Atman goes from the dead body, which is sort of like a broken chariot, and then goes into a new chariot. And so this uh, reincarnation uh, tradition uh, of moving through different lives is called samsara. And the goal, of course, is to raise your moral profile so that you're a, a righteous being, and then that eventually gets you born into a higher and higher life form, eventually a human, eventually a Brahmin, and the story in the West is not that different. Uh, if you perfect yourself morally, then your soul goes on to another place, which uh, in the West is considered to be heaven. So this tradition is there. It's the sort of the metaphysics of the soul. And it becomes very um, convenient and useful when you get to ghosts, because this is the way of talking about ghosts. Uh, loved ones who have died and gone on, but in a sense they haven't gone to the next place or the reincarnation they're sort of trapped in this liminal zone and that's how they cause all the mischief so um, that's sort of the metaphysics behind the idea of a ghost um, according to a recent poll a YouGov American poll 45 percent of Americans believe in ghosts and if you tend to believe in ghosts then you tend to see ghosts um, now you know there's some interesting psychological phenomena here that that are relevant uh, pareidolia is the phenomenon of seeing patterns where patterns may not be and so some people have suggested that seeing paranormal um, you know poltergeists and ghosts generally could just be a very overactive um, case of pattern finding in human beings um, I don't think this is wrong, per se, but I do think much more interesting stuff is happening when it comes to ghosts. I think, in a way, when you see a lot of ghost stories, and when you talk to people who have encountered ghosts, um, oftentimes it has a lot to do with something very human, which is grief. Um, someone you love has passed away, and you tend to see them then in dreams and in memories, and occasionally this crosses over into, you know, what could be called hallucinations. Now, I'm not ruling out the possibility of real ghosts here, metaphysical ghosts. I'm just suggesting that a fairly large portion of what qualifies as ghost sightings is probably much more um, in the realm of psychological anomaly. Um, there's a kind of therapeutic territory, I would argue, sort of in the nebulous zone between the real and the imagined. And this is a place of, of sort of welcomed hallucinations and ghostly conversations uh, with loved ones who've, who've sort of passed away. And this helps us deal with um, grief. And grief is, you know, as we know from affective neuroscience and psychology, grief is a kind of separation anxiety. And it's a reduction in oxytocin and internal opioids like endorphins. And oftentimes you have dreams and conversations with dead loved ones, and it can actually help you uh, feel some, some relief from this separation anxiety. Uh, some cultures have a guild of shamans or priests that help this sort of therapeutic communication with ghosts. Uh, some of us just sort of do this individually, spontaneously. You work out a cognitive habit of talking to your your lost loved one. I remember my, my father died um, recently and I noticed that I was talking to him pretty regularly. I would go into his workshop and I, I needed a tool to fix something. And this was a common conversation that we often had when he was alive. And I find myself still having this conversation with him, even though of course I know he's not there. But there's something comforting about it, strangely enough. Um, and that is, I think, a, a crucial element here. Of course, the, the skeptic basically um, finds this kind of laughable, and um, having spent a lot of time as a skeptic myself, I get it, you know. Uh, wishful thinking does not make something so. Uh, it doesn't change reality. But it's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring in William, James, um, William Blake, rather, um, in this story, because Blake 
and here I'm doing a, a quick uh, portrait of William Blake. He basically recognized that there was sort of a way of living in the world that involved a lot of our own imagination. And it wasn't just living in a fantasy, but just merging the real and the imagined. Now, why is this not crazy? Because a lot of what we experience in the world, and even what we perceive, is sculpted and shaped by things like bias. Cognitive science has shown us in the recent sort of decade that um, you know cognitive bias is very powerful. It makes you, you know, when you're hungry, you see food is bigger. When you're scared, you see, you know, uh, uh, home invaders as larger. You know, all kinds of ways in which we have bias. Uh, there can be racial, gender bias, and so on. But if you take this point more broadly to understand that your own imagination is also sculpting and shaping your perception of reality, um, then you realize that this could be um, a wonderful territory, you know, to think about and to live in. Um, the skeptic wants to get rid of this kind of territory, but Blake thought this was an important way of operating in the world. So he described seeing the world with um, sort of single vision, which he thought was science, where you're just looking for facts. And then he said there's another way of seeing the world, which is twofold vision or double vision. This involves a mix of perception and imagination. So your imagination and your values, the way you see the world as being composed of good guys and bad guys and drama, it influences, you know. So the religious thinker is already living in this twofold vision territory. Um, and then Blake says there's a third-fold vision where you have, additionally, you have sort of cosmic feelings of grace and even a, full, a four-fold vision, which, you know, we would say is kind of psychedelic. This is where you have a sense of the eternal that's present even in your own daily experience. So this is, I think, um, a fairly exciting way to think about ghost stories generally um, as a place where the you know, memories of loved ones are actually sort of filling your experience. And you may not be seeing them in some direct poltergeist, but they're sort of present and they, they merge into your consciousness and they occupy, they seem to occupy the physical space around you. And this, I think, is all fairly positive as long as it doesn't become pathological. And so these are, are sort of therapeutic aspects of, of ghosts and ghost stories. I'm, what I'm doing here in this drawing uh, is creating, recreating William Blake's uh, Ghost of a Flea. And we started out with this story at the beginning. I love the way that uh, Blake renders this thing. It looks sort of like a supervillain of some kind. It bears almost no resemblance to an actual flea. Although here in 1818 when he's drawing this, or 1819, he would have had um, access to the kind of uh, microscopic drawings that, that would have appeared in in uh, Robert Hooke's Micrographia, which, in which he does a, an amazing drawing of a, a flea. So he would have known what an actual flea looked like, but Blake doesn't seem to care what the actual flea looks like. This is a, a kind of imagined, you know, supervillain flea, which um, he's fascinated with as a bloodsucker. So this thing is a kind of vampire creature. And what you're seeing here in his uh, left hand is just a, the shell of an acorn and in his right hand is a thorn. And these are sort of symbolizing, you know, the drawing of blood and the feasting on blood. And, and um, I think it's quite idiosyncratic in a way that Blake um, had this kind of strange vision of a flea, uh, but it is still kind of uh, relevant because he thought he was tapping into this imagined reality and that it was connected to the zoological flea, but only you know, um, by a thin thread. And so this kind of stuff, I think, is fun to think about, and it helps us understand the rise of spiritualism in this period. If you look at the sort of late 19th century, early 20th century, you've got a huge burst of interest in seances. Blake was doing seances in 1819, but a um, hundred years later, uh, Americans are doing this in very high degrees, so much so that Houdini the great magician um, went on a campaign to try to stop some of it. 
It wasn't because he, dis- he disbelieved in spirits and communication with the dead, but he was so angry at the sort of charlatans that were making money on this stuff. Because people were grieving, Houdini himself had lost his mother, who he was very close to, and when he was invited on a, um, a seance with Arthur Conan Doyle, um, Arthur Conan Doyle's w- wife, who fancied herself a medium, said that she had contacted Houdini's mother. This made Houdini very angry because uh, he felt like they were running a, a game or being naive, and so he even campaigned with um, Congress to, to sort of wipe out some of the seances and mediums as a kind of business. Uh, he didn't win that case, and eventually, and he died shortly thereafter, but he continued uh, to haunt the memory of his own family. His wife uh, had a yearly seance trying to contact him ever after until she herself passed away. So it's an exciting and interesting territory, and I thought I'd just bring in some of these elements in a sort of in a sort of first pass conversation about ghosts. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you do like this kind of thing, please hit the subscribe button and come back for more content. Okay, see you next time. Take care.